Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Welcome to the 2017 Charleston Lecture in Southern Affairs. I'm Melinda Maynard Lowry, the director of the Center for the Study of the American South. The center nurtures rigorous scholarship, critical conversations, and creative expressions for a diverse and changing South. Through the Southern Oral History Program, with research grants and fellowships, the journal Southern Cultures, and in our public lectures, conversations, and performances, we elevate the stories of Southern communities to serve their futures. And in that spirit tonight, we're just thrilled to have two wonderful guests and one wonderful moderator. But before I introduce them, I want to thank Dr. Joseph Jordan, director of the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History, and his incredible staff for co-sponsoring this event tonight and for being such good collaborators. The Charleston Lecture, as the name suggests, was sponsored by UNC alumni and friends from in and around Charleston, South Carolina. Past speakers have included James E. Ferguson, John T. Edge, and Julian Bond. If you're tweeting tonight's conversation, which would be fantastic, we would welcome that, we can ask that you use the hashtag black space making. So tonight we're honored to welcome two visionary leaders who happen to be father and son. Philip Freelon is one of the most acclaimed architects of our time. His design achievements include cultural, civic, and academic projects for some of America's most respected cultural institutions. He led the design team for the $500 million Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture and he was the design architect for the National Center for Civil Rights in Atlanta. His portfolio also includes the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, Emancipation Park in Houston, the beautiful Stone Center when we find, where we find ourselves tonight, and many other remarkable spaces. He is design director at the North Carolina practice of the global architecture firm Perkins and Will. Phil Freelon is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Award for Public Architecture. Among many other awards, just last week, Phil earned the 2017 North Carolina Award for Fine Arts, the highest civilian honor in our state. Pierce Freelon and his father have much in common, but unlike his father, Pierce is a distinguished graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. <laughs> <laughs> As an undergraduate, Pierce earned a BA in African and African American Studies. He went on to co-found the Beat Making Lab, an Emmy award-winning PBS web series, and social entrepreneurship community program. That project took him around the world, from Chapel Hill to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Portobello, Panama, Dakar, Senegal, and Fiji. Back in the United States, Pierce founded Black Space, a digital makerspace in Durham where people of all ages can learn about music, filmmaking, and coding. And he became the front man of local jazz hip hop band, The Beast. In 2017, he mounted an ambitious campaign for mayor of Durham that led one major news outlet to call him this year's most exciting candidate. And we're all looking forward to witnessing the next way in which he makes history. Our moderator this evening is author, ethnographer, and professor Renee Alexander Kraft. Dr. Kraft is also an alumnus of UNC Chapel Hill, where she's currently an associate professor of communication. She has served as interim director of the Southern Oral History Program at the Center for the Study of the American South. Her research and creative projects have centered on an Afro-Latin community in Portobello, Panama, who call themselves and their carnival performance tradition, Congo. She's the author of When the Devil Knocks, The Congo Tradition and the Politics of Blackness in 20th Century Panama, as well as an interactive online project titled Digital Portobello, which combines and curates ethnographic interviews, photos, videos, artwork, and archival materials. In 2016, Dr. Kraft received the inaugural Whiting Public Engagement Fellowship for her digital humanities and community-engaged scholarship. In addition to her Portobello-focused projects, Renee Alexander Kraft re received a Durham Arts Council Ella Pratt Emerging Artist Fellowship in 2013 for I Will Love You Everywhere Always, a children's book dedicated to helping children cope with death and loss. 
She is currently working on a novel, She Looks Like Us. I'm honored and pleased to turn things over to Renee Alexander Craft. Thank you. First of all, um, I want to say thank you to the Center for the Study of the American South for this exciting opportunity. These two phenomenal gentlemen for being here, um, and you all for joining in the conversation. Um, I am trying to keep myself steady, but inside I'm, I'm just kind of <laughs> dancing all over the place at the opportunity to get to kind of curate this conversation. So I want to start um, by asking, you know, you both have done amazing work creating literal and psychosocial spaces that honor, um, I don't know if the sound went in and out. Did it? Oh, I think it's back. Um, creating spaces that honor black culture, creativity, and history. What does it mean to spatialize blackness? Um, and if you had to give a set of guiding principles to what constitutes black space, what would it be? Well, <clears throat> Being the elder, I guess I'll start. <laughs> well, for me, um, as an African American who grew up in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, I, I feel that uh, my, my work needs to convey something of our culture. Um, and so early on in my career, I decided to focus my design work on spaces that would um, inform people, enlighten people, educate folks, bring cultures together, therefore, you know, museums and libraries and the like, um, cultural centers and so forth uh, have been the focus of my practice, as well as um, educational buildings like this one, uh, college campuses, uh, K through 12 schools. And so um, for me, I always had the, the notion that um, if the building after it's done is serving the community and is, um, it's helping to uplift folks, then I feel good about it. And that led me toward these projects and, you know, understandably away from other sort of work like prisons or um, casinos, things that I didn't feel would, would feed my spirit in that way. So <clears throat> it, it was quite natural then to, to uh, infuse some of myself as an artist in, into these works. And so in that way, I, I think I can say that, um, you know, making places for uh, people of our culture is, is part of it, but also spaces that allow people to come together and share uh, different cultures as well. Yeah, um, I, you know, Dad and I have different, come from different, um, uh, different mediums. Uh, my mom is a jazz vocalist and I'm also a musical artist. Um, and I feel like, you know, my sister, for example, really, she's a visual artist, she works with her hands, she paints. Uh, I'm like my mom, I'm really into theater and music and performance. And when I think about um, black spaces, uh, I think any space where uh, we, that we occupy as black people, uh, when we kind of resonate and, and, and express our cultural vibrations is a, can be a black space. So when I'm, you know, at the house and my mom is, is like doing her Ella Fitzgerald scatting thing and, uh, you know, or, or if we're at a concert or, or if I'm at a cypher where there's a bunch of rappers and MCs and beat makers together collaborating, we, in a sense, I feel like uh, we're summoning our ancestors through that cultural practice. And that's what, that's what makes it a black space. It's, it's, it is uh, very much um, an extension of our uh, heritage and an, an, ex and an, an expression of our legacy to practice art. And for, you know, like I said, for me, that, that's very much rooted in hip hop, uh, which I can trace back to like the West African griot tradition. Um, and uh, you know, for my mom, it might be jazz. For your um, parents, it might have been the blues or um, you know, before them, perhaps spirituals. Uh, so, but but when we when we when we practice this art, we're we're essentially like welcoming our ancestors into the space, and that to me is what transforms the space into a black space. Any space can be a black space, 
you know. Um, and I, I don't know that I recognized it as such when I was younger, um, but when I, uh, this year, uh, a great uh, cultural um, giant icon, role model of mine uh, passed away. His name was Baba Chuck Davis. And, uh, you know, I remember the first time I saw him it was at, um, I'm from Durham. I went to E.K. Poe Elementary School and he was a part of a dance collective called the African American Dance Ensemble. And they would come in, you know, just like you have assemblies at elementary school. They would come in with the dance troupe and they hit the drums and they had the big old dashikis on. And, you know, he'd say, I'll go. we say, I may, you know, I'll go. Yeah, so he, he, he does a call, we do a response. And at the time, I, I just felt like a little, I didn't really know how to describe it, like a little tingle, you know, a little like, you know, a little, um, he was communicating and resonating with me in a way that I couldn't articulate at, you know, in first grade or whatever. But I've come to recognize that tingle as the, as the, the vibration of my ancestors. He was speaking through the voice of my great, great, great grandparents, and I feel it, I recognize it. And, uh, and even today, I feel his presence when I'm engaged in, in kind of creative activity. And when I bring young people into that practice with me, um, I feel like I'm welcoming them into that same uh, energy. So, so yeah, that for me is, is how I would describe uh, and articulate what, what, what makes a space like a black space. One of the things um, you both have really done and in your intergenerational collaboration and conversations showcases too is the power of making way and making space too. Um, so, I'll, and not just in the, a literal sense, but also the space you've made available for yourselves and the space you've made open and available for other people. And so I wanted to ask you about, both of you, about um, that sense of space making. How, how have you all been able to kind of get a seat at the table, um, get your, yourselves in positions to affect the kind of change that you do? And how have you worked to create opportunities, intergenerational opportunities, for other people to have a seat at the table? Okay, well, <clears throat> as, as an architect, there's as, as a very uh, prescribed path toward being a professional and, and, and a licensed architect. <clears throat> it begins with education, and then you have an internship similar to what doctors and lawyers might do. There's an examination, and then you work for other people. So I, I did all of those things um, and kind of learned my craft from observing uh, in the firms where I interned and, and later worked as a professional. So when I decided to start my own practice, I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to do and also what I did, did not want to do. Uh, and, you know, I, I realized that the space in which you're working is an important part of it. And so when, uh, when I started the Freeline Group and after a few years we, we had our own building and that space became uh, a, a, um, a focus for other people to come and see what architects do. Now, there are very few African-American architects in the country, and so my way of addressing that is to try to be more um, demonstrative about what we do and invite people in to see it, young people. Uh, and so the building that we, we were in, and even now we, we've come downtown and we're in the um, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Building on the second floor, which has its own kind of history to it. And so we want people to come and see what we do. It's, it's not just going to the buildings and, and, or reading in the paper or reading in books about architecture, but seeing how it's done and seeing the collaborative nature of what we do and, and seeing people of color doing it uh, is, is a really important part of, of what you're talking about, and demonstrating that, yes, you can do this, and this is a viable career for, for young African-Americans and anyone. You know, The architecture profession is not very diverse and so we have to work hard at trying to uh, be more inclusive uh, with that. Yeah, I think about, uh, there's as, you ever, the word Sankofa, you know, there's a, there's a West African symbol. It's a bird walking forward, looking backward, kind of has this idea of like a cyclical um, uh, approach to, to time and, um, 
you know, Sankofa to me is embodied in my dad's work in, in, the, in the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. And walking through that museum, you can see past, present, and future. And, and I think that, um, you know, for me at Black Space, we call ourselves Afrofuturists. <laughs> And we root ourselves in the tradition of other Afrofuturists. So for me, like Af the, the quintessential Afrofuturist is Harriet Tubman. And, and I, I, I first heard this articulated by Alexis Pauline Gums, who is a Durhamite, radical black feminist, intellectual, like powerhouse. powerhouse. And I said, hmm, Harriet Tubman, Afrofuturist. So, she lived in a time and in a place where, you know, slavery is just the system. That is the status quo. That is the world that she grew up in, her, her, her ancestors, her peers. Slavery was this pervasive, powerful mechanism. And she had the audacity to think, nah, something else is possible. Like, we're going to figure out some other kind of situation. And... And so in the crafting of the Underground Railroad, which to me is like, you know, Parliament fucking Delaware, that's like the mothership, we about to get out of here. They didn't have the mothership, so they did the railroad, you know, and uh, which was a new technology, you know, at the time. And, uh, and I think about how, how she used that railroad to get people free to manifest the world that was not her present world. And, and again and again, whether it's, you know, Ella Baker or Ida B. Wells or Billie Holiday, the, the way that they use their art or their scholarship in, 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 um, in, uh, uh, as a journalist or whatever tool, whatever gift they had was being applied to creating a world that, that we don't see yet, but we know we need to move towards. And so for me in the present, uh, I think it's important for us to create spaces where we envision the future and we envision the future as it needs to be. And how do we do that? I, I think we, we, we do that by, by rooting ourselves in the past, which is what Sankofa is all about. You, you can't understand your, your future without looking at your past. As Marcus Garvey said, uh, a people without knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. Yeah. You know, wind blows a tree without roots, yonk, you know? You're knocked over, you got those roots though. You, you're solid. You couldn't, you couldn't do anything to move that tree. And so I feel like that's what we need as a people. And you know, we, we, what the museum does for me, that's a sturdy trunk for our people in this country. Uh, and it took us 100 years to, to get there, you know? And the stories are, are, are so important to, to elevate and, and to illuminate you know, everyone knows, well, not everyone, but Harry Tubman is, is a name and a, and a story that's familiar. There are so many other uh, really powerful examples of African-American people who um, have succeeded against all odds. And, and mm -hmm. so the museum is as much about celebrating those names that we all know about, but also the unsung heroes. Uh, and looking back is, is important. And I'm glad you said the future too, because mm -hmm. As children, anyone, any age goes in there, you, you, know, you, you get the sense that almost anything is possible. Mm. You know, just think about how uh, the forced migration brought us here um, and all the struggles that we, and we continue to face, but look at, look at what, we've been, what we've been able to achieve a, as a people. And that's important for everyone to see, not just us. Yeah. And so uh, people come to the museum from all over the, all over the world, different cultures, and I think it's, it's important for folks um, to see that in the context of America, not isolated, not just for us, it's for everyone to see and celebrate. Yeah, absolutely. I have two questions that link those both together, which is first, this one is for, for you, Pierce. I really like that, I, I really love that in your way of explaining Afrofuturism and giving examples of Afrofuturism, that you use Sankofa as a part of that. Um, for those who may be unfamiliar with what Afrofuturism is, how, would, how do you define it? Uh, <clears throat> I would define Afrofuturism as uh, envisioning the future that could be, you know, 
while rooting ourselves in the past. So basically, you know, the, Sanco the Sankofa is a, is a useful tool for me to be able to conceptualize Afrofuturism because also because we need to be using African tools to help Af us get free as African people. Like we've been, we've had so much intellectually and otherwise imposed on us, even our language, the language that we're speaking right now is not the language that my ancestors used. There were different nuances and humor and subtleties of, of the African uh, heritage that were erased, um, which is very intentional, you know, to, to, to take European names and, and to be reared with this, you know, spiritual traditions and all these other things were intended to, to erase that, uh, that legacy. But there are parts of it, as uh, Amiri Baraka writes about in Blues People, that cannot be erased, you know? And so we found ways to, to, to twist it and improvise and to create, you know, some gumbo out of that, um, you know, out of that porridge they were trying to force down our throats. Um, so I do think that uh, for me, yeah, Afrofuturism is about, um, is about building, uh, building the future uh, while kind of being rooted in that past. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the way we do that at Black Space is by, um, you know, we train kids in, in different digital technologies that'll prepare them for the future, but it's like a, a culturally relevant curriculum that, that roots them in their ancestry. And that's how we have that kind of time machine philosophy and how we move it forward. And we were just talking about it. Um, we're, we're gonna be getting a bus to go to DC to, to check out the museum. Um, hopefully that'll become an annual thing for kids. Um, we haven't figured out all the details yet, so if anybody got kids out there, you know, it's not, we're not signing fo folks up yet, but it's something that we've talked about, an imperative part of what we're doing as, as, as time travelers is to, is to go back to sling forward. It's like pulling the slingshot back before you let it rip. Yeah. And Link, thank you for that. And linked to that, um, I also really appreciate um, your uplifting Alexis's way of framing Harriet Tubman as an Afrofuturist, you know, someone who was able to radically imagine a different reality and push blacks forward to a different reality. And the way in which um, the stunning museum, the stunning, you know, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture embodies that. Um, and I think it's so interesting, uh, Sankofa, thinking about Sankofa and thinking about the structure itself, because um, it, it is a structure that, fe that has a feel of being both rooted in a past, it, it has a, it's sturdy. I mean, it has a very kind of sturdy, a sturdy look to it, but it also has a kind of spaceship, um, you know, uh, moving forward, um, thinking forward, being forward, feel to it. And so I wanted to ask you about that in terms of your intention and in, in designing it. And that, as well as the fact that it, each one of the buildings I've gotten to be in that you've designed has a feeling of being dignified without being pretentious and a feeling of being really open. And, and the museum very much is that way. So is this building. So I wanted to get to ask you about those things. Well, let's, let's talk about the museum. And, and, and when I speak uh, about the design, I always want to recognize the partners, the collaboration. Um, and our team was uh, Freelon Ajay Bond Smith Group. And so uh, Max Bond, who, who's deceased now, and I decided um, to pursue this project over a decade ago. And you know, we met in DC and we decided we would not compete against each other. Let's form an alliance, you know, Freelon Bond. And later David Ajay, the talented British architect, joined our team. We won an international design competition. And the building um, is, you know, uh, is pretty much what that concept was. And so that piece about being powerful and dignified, but also um, exuberant, uh, all those were, things were intentional. If you think about the location there in Washington in the midst of all the other Smithsonian buildings and, and other monuments and the monumental core, many of the buildings, most of them are, are marble or concrete or you know these white structures or gray. And, and so this is a distinctive departure from that intentionally, uh, which is no small feat in DC with all the regulations and uh, being looked at 
uh, under a microscope almost by the regulatory agencies and uh, people who some, some of whom did not want this to happen. Um, and so the, the, the building is, um, is simulating a bronze color, a metallic finish that, and, and bronze, you know, it suggests longevity, it suggests uh, quality, permanence, um, and it's, it can be dark, you know, depending on the light conditions or if the sun hits it just right, it can be almost ablaze with reflection of, of, uh, of the sunlight. And so it's a dynamic facade that changes uh, in the course of a day and across the seasons. Uh, and, and that we think is, is appropriate because our story isn't only about victims and perpetrators. There are dark moments and we must tell the truth and, and that's important. But it's also about celebration and it's about resilience um, and making a way out of no way. And, and so these things are subtle. The, the, the form was um, derived from a crown type uh, shape that was part of Yoruban architecture. There's a, um, a form called a caryatid that is a column that has a base, a, a body, and a capital that, that is a crown. And, and the walls are, are tilted outward in a, in a way that you don't see in Western architecture. Uh, and so that distinction, the form, the materiality of it, and the, um, the light permeability, right? There's light emanating from it at night and during the day, the pattern that is created by the uh, openings in the corona, uh, you know, give a certain feel when you're inside the building. Mm -hmm. And even that pattern has a, a connection back to African-American culture. Uh, we, we took those uh, intricate um, metal uh, designs that you see in places like um, Charleston and New Orleans, the, the gilded ironwork. And this is a, um, a modern interpretation of those patterns. Uh, and, and all these things are subtle. We, we want people to scratch their head and think and interpret it in different ways. We've had people say, okay, it looks like um, a, a, a woman's hat in church. It looks like, and, and so there, there is room for you to bring your own experience and interpret that. It's not a literal transposition of, of an idea, mm -hmm. but uh, all of our buildings, particularly the ones that, that have a, a basis in, in culture, uh, we want the building to help tell the story, not mm -hmm. simply be a, um, a beautiful wrapper around content or, or exhibits, but the building itself can help to tell the story and draw people in and be part of a narrative. And that's what we tried to accomplish. Don't you, don't you love listening to him talk? I could just be like, oh. He said, it, it can be dark, but when the sun comes on it, it's a blaze. I'm just like, yes. I could talk about this building for another few yes. hours, so we need to. <laughs> Woo. I love that. That that no, the passion with which you speak about it gets me hype. I want to go back. That's good. Let's do it. Yeah. That's great. Um, I want to ask another question about the museum. In other interviews, I've heard you say it came along at just the right time, right? That you you know you were prepared at that time. I want to know what aspects of other projects helped you prepare for some of the things you tried out, you and, the, and, the, and your collaborators um, were able to do in the museum? Well, this building is one of them. Uh, this auditorium is the shape that it is because it simulates a drum. Again, it's not literal. You can't see the skin stretched across the roof or whatever for a drum. But, you know, the iconography is there. The columns out front are tapered. That's another form you don't see in Western <laughs> architecture. And that comes from an African tradition. Uh, and, you know, I think anyone in the arts would tell you that your personal experiences along the way feed into the next project. And you bring, you know, something of yourself and your, your uh, interactions with other people, places you visited, um, you know, your education, your family is, is a huge part of this. And being in a, in a household with Pierce and the, my other two children are just as talented. And my wife, Nina, you know, is incredible. So you bring all of that to your artwork. And, and I happen to consider architecture an art, yeah. the, the original art. <laughs> it's, art. It's art with utility. You get, you get to use it. You get to, you know, it has a purpose. Um, and you don't have to pay, in most cases, you don't have to pay to, to go and see it in a museum. You know, people walk through it. So, um, and I'll talk about a building that's not a museum. It's the bus station in Durham. 
I'm as proud of that building. It's a beautiful building that everyday people get to see and enjoy um, architecture at, at the highest level. And it's just a bus station. And in most cities, that is a, not a place you'd want to go or, or think about as, as an architectural opportunity. But I'm very proud to, to have been involved in creating a space where uh, you don't have to go to Washington to see it. You can just, you know, people who, who can't afford a car go there and take the bus. And, uh, and so, you know, these, these buildings can, can, um, can have an impact on, on the people and, uh, that are in it. And I'll, I'll end my comments about this by saying in, in education, if you can inspire children, you know, a natural light are com is coming into the space, you're more inclined to get through to them in terms of education. They're, they're more alert. Um, and so the environment, the colors that you use, all, all these things have an impact. Mm -hmm. And we take this very seriously. Excellent. Thank you. Um, feeding off of that, I want to ask both of you, collaboration is really so much at the core of the work that both of you do. If you had to uplift two one or two of your most memorable collaborations or most meaningful collaborations, what, what were they? And who, who are some of your dream collaborators, um, people you'd really love to work with? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, my number one collaborator would be my wife, Katie. Um, you know, and our, our creative projects are Justice and Stella. <laughs> You've done a good job with yeah. them. They're, they're incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I definitely think that, uh, you know, raising a family is, is its own art form and it requires, you know, improvisation, patience, you know, study, hard work, observation, you know, um, all those things. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think my parents uh, would be another important set of collaborators. Um, though I didn't see it at the time, I, I understand now that I'm a parent how I was teaching them things and it was, a, it was an exchange. Um, but you know, my parents taught me a lot of things. Uh, one of the more important lessons I think uh, as I reflect on my parents is like, you know, it's bold to, to have a job and then to leave that security to p pursue a passion or interest or to, or to you know, discard that comfort to go for something risky. And um, you know, again, I, I, I was able to reflect later in life about what it, what it took for a father with three young children in a steady gig to say like, I'm gonna start my own business. You know, same for my mom who was like studying medicine and could have been a nurse or you know, healthcare professional you know, she, she, her passion was music. And she, um, and my dad, you know, talked and made the choice. I've heard her tell the story a bunch of times about, um, you know, after I was born and, and, you know, on my own two feet a little bit, there was a choice, you know, do you go back to UNC's hospital to finish up and have a, you know, steady, reliable income, you know, to supplement these three beautiful brown bodies you just brought into the planet? Or um, you know, or do you pursue your passion and sing and, and go into music, and uh, and uh, you know, I don't know how if you ever if you ever think about that as a collaboration, but you know, uh, we participated in that choice, and uh, you know, I, I went to my mom t with my mom to these random concerts and backstage hanging with her musician friends and learning dirty jokes on the side, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and I I inherited that. Um, that will and that wisdom um, and, and bring it into my life and marriage as a parent, uh, as a father, um, and as a husband. And, uh, and I think that, that you know, we collectively, both my, the immediate family I was born into and the one that I've chose, uh, have, um, are, are building this kind of growing, uh, um, you know, I don't know, symphony or, you know, the, 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 there's still a lot of empty spaces on the canvas for us to fill with different projects and collaborations. And, and I, I really appreciate, um, yeah, yeah, I would say my wife and my parents, best two collaborators. Yeah. Wow, uh, I've got to concur. You know, the luckiest day was, of my life was meeting Nina. For, um, 
on Bob Powell's porch. <laughs> hey, that's my godfather and, right uh, there. And, you know, <laughs> and uh, I think back to a collaborant, Robert, Professor Robert Powell from a and is here, and uh, he and I collaborated, and this is the reason Nina and I met. We were uh, moonlighting on a, a project working for uh, um, an attorney, Buddy Malone in, in Durham, and I was working on that on the side, and and uh, went over to Bob's house to talk about the plants. And there was this beautiful woman there, you know, visiting from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, you know, the rest is history. So thank you, Bob, for that. <laughs> um, some of my favorite collaborations were with this gentleman right here. I remember one time uh, we were asked to do a, a program, not dissimilar from this, but Pierce was the moderator oh, yeah. to interview myself and Nina up in Martha's Vineyard. Oh, yeah. um, and it was so much fun because we didn't know the questions he was going to ask. And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, when he asked about Nina's hair, that was, uh, that was all over after that. <laughs> I said, if you'd warned me, I could have warned you about that one. <laughs> don't ever ask a black woman about her hair. <laughs> uh, and then I, I mentioned, uh, you know, about architecture being, it's all about collaboration. You know, I, I get uh, press and attention for buildings, but it's, it's not one person. Um, it's all about the people that you work with and um, I'm particularly proud to have uh, spawned a number of firms uh, of folks who mentored under me, and, and it's just a proud moment to see that those collaborations have resulted in uh, new, new opportunities for young African-American architects in our region. Thank you. Do, do you all have someone or a group of folks on your wish list of people you really want to collaborate with that you haven't so far? Well, I, I was wanting to collaborate with President Ob Barack Obama on his library, but the, that didn't work out. <laughs> but uh, that was a dream, another dream project for me. Um, uh, and, you know, right now working on the Motown Museum has been wonderful, uh, you know, meeting Barry Gordy and uh, working with the board there uh, has been a terrific collaboration. And, you know, those sorts of things. When I can work with people who, who can be uh, partners in the design uh, of these buildings is, 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 is really great. So I'm, all, I'm always open to the next one. Yeah, for me, uh, the dream collaborator would be the city of Durham. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I, I uh, you know, there's an open city council seat. I'm trying to get on there. Uh, and anyone who wants to email your city council members and tell them what time it is, you can feel free to do so. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, I recently uh, <coughs> saw, I think this was an older interview, Phil, that you did, and you talked about visiting uh, your grandson's um, second grade class at the time. Um, was that Justice's mm -hmm. class? Yeah. Uh, and you, uh, talk to them a little bit about kind of what art has to do in some ways, what architecture and art have to do with liberation. Um, uh, and I wanted to ask that question for us to witness too. What does art have to do with liberation? What does art have to do with um, helping us move forward in our current civil rights struggle? Well, I think that everyone has, there's an artist inside of all of us. Now, now how is it expressed? You may, you may be a writer, you may be a chef, uh, you could be an, an educator. And it's up to each of us to, to find that thing that feeds our spirit and how do we help other people through our art. And so we talked to the children about that and I wanted them to understand that, um, that these buildings, we brought models there so they could see it and, and that's sort of the, um, you know, the last few steps of the process, but it's all about an idea and how can you get that idea uh, out of your mind and on paper or singing or dancing, somehow express that thought so that other people can, can latch onto it and you can build it together into something um, you know, that can be shared. And so uh, it, it, you know, I, I wanted to, to get them to connect with the notion of, of um, that thoughts can really be powerful things. And when you share a powerful thought, then it has momentum and then you can, um, you know, you can really uh, you know, pick up steam with it. Yeah, I wanna add to that. Um... Thoughts are very powerful, and uh, this is another thing we talk about a lot at Black Space. Um, that's why it's so important that we, that we use our thoughts to imagine what the world could and should look like, because a lot of thought has gone into the world that we currently exist 
in. And uh, I was thinking as you were talking about the power of art, about the positive ways that, that art can be used to open people's minds and hearts, and then the negative ways. I remember you got uh, recognized by the Durham Board of County Commission, the county commissioners, and we went in there, which is in the old Durham courthouse where the Confederate statue, uh, the, what was it called, the Boys Who Wore Gray. I was about to say Silent Sam. There's a Confederate statue on this campus as well. But uh, we had to walk by that statue in order to get in this building where my dad was being honored for this museum that this Confederates would have burned down had they had the chance. And, uh, you know, that's, it's a piece of art. It's a sculpture um, that is meant to convey a certain message um, and was erected for a particular purpose. And, uh, you know, the, the museum and, you know, the recent monument of Dr. King, um, I think are, um, you know, our artwork that tells a very different story, a very different narrative. And I'm just really excited in Durham um, about what's gonna replace that monument. Um, and I, I can think of a lot of amazing Durhamites, my dad included, but also people like Polly Murray and uh, Ernie Barnes, Baba Chuck Davis. My, <laughs> yeah, that, um, uh, that, deserve to be acknowledged and honored and raised up and memorialized and immortalized. Um, and so, yeah, I think we should be cognizant of that as we think about the power of art, um, is that there, there are ways in which, um, you know, ways in which that can be used and, and, and leveraged to tell, you know, a story that, that's painful or harmful or representative of, of, of oppression and power over others. Mm -hmm. I wanna shift gears just a little bit and ask a different kind of question. So, uh, and I'll tell you where this question comes from before I actually ask it. One of my favorite um, writers growing up, and still is, I love uh, Nikki Giovanni, and among a whole litany of folks. But I remember thinking that she was, as, I, as my poet self, my young poet self was reading her work, she just seemed already made. I mean, whatever she was, the greatness that she was, the greatness that other idols I had um, who were literary figures, they were too far from me. And then I read Gemini, and I loved hearing her talk about moments of failure because all of a sudden then I could imagine a trajectory from the little space I occupied to the big space she did. Given that, you know, I think you all are at, both of you are at places at your career and being that it seemed, you know, you just fell from the sky as these, <laughs> as these brilliant, you know, great folks who have a sense of your voice. You, um, so I want to ask, what are moments, you know, Pierce, you talked a little bit about moments of risk that your dad took and moments of risk that your mom took, but what, beyond risk, what are moments that felt like perceived failures at the time but they really were door openers for you, or they made a way for you to do things you couldn't have imagined without that. Yeah, well, first I wanna say something about your idol, Nikki Giovanni. Um, I met her when I was in grad school at Syracuse, and she had a tattoo of Thug Life on her arm. And I was like, Thug Life, uh, you know, tell me about the tat. And she was like, well, I'm a big fan of Tupac. And, uh, you know, when he passed away, she was kind of telling her story. And that was one thing I really appreciated about her. I was like, you know who Tupac was? Like, you know. So uh, anyway, Nikki Giovanni is awesome. Um, but also I think part of what makes her such an amazing poet is, is how uh, connected and current she is with beyond, um, you know, the, the era in which she was, uh, you know, writing, um, you know, the, the civil rights era, the height of that uh, black power, black arts movement. Um, so, but anyway, uh, well, I think the, the most recent example is the mayoral election. So um, I ran super hard <laughs> for mayor and didn't win. And that was really hard um, in the days after the election to kind of process all the work we put in and all the strategy and kind of uh, um, t 
time and effort and energy and thought and prayer that went into that campaign, um, you know, after that primary, the, the first thing was just sleep. So I slept for about 48 hours because I was exhausted. Um, the day of the election was up from like four o'clock in the morning to about two o'clock at night till the very last vote, vote was counted. And, um, you know, there was, a, there was a real sense of, of uh, frustration. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I still don't know that there's anything else we could have done. We, we did so much and so many things very well um, that it was, it was, it was tough to, to begin the process. Um, but, you know, after some time, about, uh, you know, a couple days after the election, I began just to reflect on the experience and how rich it was. And it was very, very rich experience, um, connecting uh, with uh, folks in the city of Durham, uh, envisioning that Afrofuturist work of envisioning what, uh, what a city like Durham could look like if we fully realized our you know, progressive potential um, to, to eliminate and, and seriously address things like poverty and affordable housing and uh, public safety in creative and radical ways. Um, that, was a, that was an amazing, beautiful process. And, uh, and it's not done, like that work will, is, continues. And, uh, you know, I, I could do nothing after, you know, I got over it, <laughs> not over it, but after I had some time to reflect on it and truly look at what happened and not just kind of feel the bruises from immediately getting through it, I, I had only thankfulness and appreciation and gratitude um, and then motivation to continue. Um, and I was told over and over again, I had so many wonderful people say, hey, this was a victory, it was a good first step. Even Obama lost when he first ran for Senate. There's, there's a lot of that and, and I hear that too, but the experience in and of itself is, is, is opening a door that I perhaps can't even see yet in this moment. And, and I'm, I have faith that, 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 um, that I'm on the right trajectory um, and that we were, we were doing, doing what needed to be done. I'll just tell you a really quick story. I saw this on YouTube. Uh, sometimes you get lost on YouTube. This is one of those times. Uh, it was a guy talking about how when a plane takes off, um, it has to assume like a, you know, a trajectory that, you know, it's, it's like, a, 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 I don't know how to describe it, like a higher angle to get where it needs to go. It, it doesn't just like boom and go straight. Um, and so shooting high and being ambitious and going for the big goal is, is how you get to where you need to go. Um, if you just kind of do what's in your wheelhouse or what you think is feasible or, or within your capabilities, then you know you're not going to get very far. So that was a an interesting an anecdote for me to think about the physics of forward movement. And uh, and again, uh, let's bring Harriet back into the space and and think about what she was able to accomplish by reaching for the unfathomable. You know, and even though she didn't she didn't realize. Uh, in her lifetime, probably the full extent of what she expected, we are where we are today, which is probably something she would never have fathomed in this space with this architect and this audience, you know, that was so far beyond, you know, what she was going for, which was end chattel slavery, you know, like, and, and I think that it is, it is with those wildly ambitious uh, leaps that over time we can begin to, you know, make the, progress that we've seen. Um, and so we need everyone out here, everyone needs to be kind of, kind of shooting beyond the scope of what they think is possible. Um, and, and it's only there where we realize our true potential, um, you know. Yeah, and I'm so proud of this guy. Oh. I mean, yeah. that, you know, it's just, <laughs> that, that, that campaign was, was just um, a step, and, and it's an important step. And we have to realize that what some people call failure is just life's lessons. Um, you don't learn much from the successes. And Nina and I talk a lot, uh, off and on, about um, you know, people look at our family and say, oh gosh, this is, 
Grammy-nominated jazz vocalist and a successful architect, and everything's beautiful. They don't see the, the struggles and, and some of the failures that, that uh, lead to that. And we're grateful for those hard moments because it, it, it strengthens your character. You learn from much more from your failures than successes. And I'll share a few with you, okay? Um, you know, one that still stings is uh, uh, years ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, we uh, were pursuing a project in Pittsburgh, the African-American Cultural Center there, <clears throat> and really put my heart and soul into the effort. Uh, it was a competition among architects. Um, we didn't get it, and I was just, it still stings when I think about it. Um, but the person who, who won, a colleague of mine, I was happy for her, Allison Williams, and uh, she designed what was later named the uh, August Wilson Center in, in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, and, you know, that experience, you know, I, I learned how to do better the next time. And um, what, you know, you go back and say, why did I fail? Or, you know, what are the reasons? And you learn from that. Uh, and, you know, that relationship with Allison, she ended up being on the board of the, um, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco and advocated for me there and we, we were successful there. So, you know, these things come around and you can always learn something from even the darkest moments of your life. And I think that's something that we can all think about. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I want to make a quick comment and then I want to open it up so that we can expand the conversation. Um, Pierce, this is just a reflection um, uh, for you and, and, and what it meant to other, you know, especially other artists um, watching you run. Um, it was, um, it's, it's hard not to get emotional saying it. It was really empowering and beautiful because watching you speak from a place of true authenticity about love for the community, about some of the vision you had moving forward, and that you use the word love in your platform. I remember looking around when I first saw you do that, I'm like, hey, can, I, can you, you get to do that? He gets to do that. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to get to do, and I know that it works from the core of who you are. The other beautiful and joyous thing um, was knowing that I'd see you at different events in Durham during the, the race. And I remember telling somebody this. I was like, well, I know he'll be here whether or not he, he wins because he was here last year. You know, he's, in, he's working in community and being in community the way I know him to be. And to see someone do that as um, bringing multiple kind of leadership experiences, but bringing your artist self unapologetically and your loving and community-centered self unapologetically was just, you know, it opened up a sense of spaciousness for many of us at a time when the political landscape, the broader national political landscape especially, just has you feeling so pulled down. So even experience, that you can't experience spaciousness and go back and be comfortable without it, right? You end up longing for it. So I just wanted you to know, you've opened up that space, you know, for so many of us at a time we need it. So thank you. Um, thank you. Now I want to open it up uh, to the audience to hear what kind of questions, how might um, we get you all to enter into the conversation? Yes. Uh, first of all, Dr. Crash, excellent job. Uh, this is a question and there's a thought as well for you. I'm looking at black space making and the built environment. Dr. Kraft asked about collaboration. How about, you don't need a statue, how about a Freeland Center with architectural work from Mr. Freeland, and a place where kids can practice music. You, you currently now got a, a Latino group who doesn't have a place to practice, and the neighbors are complaining. Yeah. So through federal funding, that's the politician side. Hey. Uh, through federal funding, get a vacant building, get your dad, architect, company, come in, renovate it, fight the hate tie, one of your dad's work, have them come in, teach not just arts, these kids out here don't have computers. You have volunteers, community service. You got UNC, you got Central. Have your students come in, tour. Give them a place to practice. Name it whatever you want to name it. 
But it's better than looking at a statue. It gives you something to build on. Mm -hmm. And this way, you, you both giving back to the community together. Mm -hmm. Tell them. Yeah, well, uh, we're doing that already. Right? We're doing that. So that um, my, uh, my parents purchased a church on the corner of Gear and North Street in Durham. And uh, it, was, it was our campaign headquarters um, during the campaign, but they, they didn't buy it for that reason. They bought it because uh, when, when, I, when we were growing up, my grandmother called our house the Freelon Healing Center um, because she thought it was a holy place. She's a woman of God. She said, Jesus is a holy place. Jesus is in this place. And uh, we used to live in an old monastery. Um, and uh, the, the same folks that designed that building also built a church for the deaf in the 30s in Durham. And this is the church that, that uh, has been purchased. Uh, it'll be a space for a lot of the things you talked about. It'll be a space for youth, um, you know, for film screenings and dance performances and yoga and, you know, all types of stuff, musical performances and, and whatnot. Um, so I'm glad you said that, same wavelength. Um, but I think that's part of the, you know, that, that is the ultimate collaboration, I think, for my parents. Um, you know, my mother with her music, my dad with, with kind of the visual arts and the engineering part. Um, there's a lot there that our community needs and our kids need um, to kind of uh, address some of the issues that our communities face, which, you know, uh, our, our public schools are, are suffering. Our, our kids who are most vulnerable have the least resources. Um, and so it is right on the bus line. It's in the community. And that is something that, yeah, I'm glad you said that. Um, that is something that will uh, get wings uh, in 2018 and, and will be a resource for the community. Yeah. Are there other questions or comments? Yes. Well, um, you know, when I, when I started my firm, I, I talked earlier about the kind of work I wanted to do, and it seemed like uh, most of that is in the public realm. Um, and, and so, uh, in some ways, uh, it's coincidental uh, with buildings uh, on campuses that are publicly funded or, or that way. Um, many museums have that component. And so, if you're gonna be working in, in that environment, you, you know, it necessitates a, um, you know, getting to know the political uh, landscape uh, and, and being involved in that way. So, uh, and, and I like people, I like to, to uh, engage folks uh, in, in forums like this. And, and so for me, it was a natural that, that I would gravitate toward the public sector in, in my work. And, and it's been very rewarding for me. Yeah, I think for me, um, <clears throat> I felt a real sense of, uh, like I did a mix of public and private school. I always felt like an alien in private school, um, you know, and, and even uh, in college here at UNC, there was a sense of uh, separation from the community that raised me, a sense of kind of ivory tower exclusive, exclusivity, and even a sense of disdain among my peers for the city of Durham and the people of Durham. <laughs> And uh, that always really bothered me. And so I always found myself, even as a student here, with kind of one foot on campus and one in the community. And uh, when I graduated and was thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, um, it was, I was very drawn towards public spaces and, uh, and providing some of the resources that, I, uh, that a lot of my peers took for granted as students on this very privileged campus. Uh, to try to figure out ways to to open up and create access for people who don't who don't have the privilege of being a, a student here, having a one card. Um, so uh, you know, for me, that that first manifested in in beat making lab. Uh, I was I was teaching a class here 
in the music department where we teach kids how to make beats. And I was thinking, wow, you know, I teach this after school program in East Durham. Like, why, why, don't, we use, why don't we bring the same curriculum uh, to the community? And it was so much richer. Like the beats of these 16, 15 year olds were hotter than the beats I was hearing on campus. No offense, you know, with all these, you know, uh, you know, young uh, college students, but you know, for them, I think a lot of folks were intrigued at the at the concept of I can get three credit hours to learn how to make beats, as they were kind of juggling that elective amongst the other their major, and so they would come in for a couple hours a week, come out, uh, put a little bit of work in. Whereas when we went into the community, these kids they were hungry, just argh, just all over the laptops making. Uh, tracks like their lives depended on it because for some of them it did. You know, they, they see this as like an opportunity for them to, to get on and to get their career moving forward. And so there's a hunger and a passion and a vigor and a love that I felt in the community space that I, that I didn't feel as, as much on campus. And, and so that, that I, I feed off that energy. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, uh, for me that, I think that uh, a lot of what, um, and this goes for anybody out here who might be on the fence about what their passion is, when you walk through life and, and experience different things, you can get that tingle, that same kind of tingle I talked about uh, with Baba Chuck, your ancestors are speaking to you or something, some people call it like butterflies in your stomach, sometimes you meet it when you're with somebody you love, or when you're listening to your dad talk, <laughs> you get that tingle. And, uh, you know, the, 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 as you follow the breadcrumbs of the things that, that make you stir, then, 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 you, then you, you forge the path of, towards what your passion is. And, and my passion is, has oftentimes been in, in community public spaces. I think that's a great way. I'm, I'll let this go as our, our last one. And this, I was going to say, this, this sense of energy is a great way to start closing us out. So I think this will be our last question, and then we'll give these great folks good attention. Uh, you guys, you know, love you guys. Thank you for sharing yourselves with us in so many different ways. Just very quickly, I want to let you know, I didn't know when I went to the bus station to drop off some books that it was a bus station. You know, we got there, and I was like, so where's the bus station? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to, as, as you guys were talking about Afrofuturism, I was thinking about faith. So connecting the dots for me, where you were talking about Harriet Tubman, me, and I don't know if you remember this, when Leon and I came to Black Space the first time, we were like, okay, we're in our 60s. These are all young babies. Felt a little out of space, out of place. But um, as we were coming through, the kids were sitting on, on the floor, you know, in all kinds of different positions, making poetry, you know, writing. And as I was coming up the stairs, do you remember when they were doing FAI, TH phase? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you know, so I was just wanted, wanted you guys to speak a little bit about what the difference is between Afrofuturism and faith. And faith. Oh yeah, it's connected. Yeah, well, uh, I'm glad you brought us back to Harriet Tubman. We're full circle now. We started with Harriet. And um, one of the things that I learned from uh, Alexis is that I didn't know was that Harriet Tubman had trouble sleeping because she was, she was banged in the head as a, as a young kind of rambunctious slave um, enslaved African, sorry, as, as, a, as a black woman, African woman who was enslaved and she suffered some head trauma from uh, someone who was trying to get her to do something she didn't want to do. And uh, as a result of that, she was like an insomniac. She, she had waking dreams and, and she couldn't really sleep. And so she was often times, a lot of people talked about her. I don't know if what we would diagnose it as now is epilepsy or, or what, what was going on, but she kind of slept walked and she was often kind of in a dreamlike state. And I, I think that's, that's, an interesting, uh, that's an interesting condition for a person who's envisioning what our freedom looks like. You know, somebody who is literally, you know, and, and, and even in, when we use the word dreaming, like you're a dreamer, that's, that's like a far shot, that's a dream. We talk about, you know, um, following your dreams is another way of saying like pursuing your passions but really that that kind of altered state of reality where you can see something no one else can see because you know your your brain works a little different than everybody else's 
and, and you're kind of in a situation where I'm always in my dreams, you know what I mean? I think that is a really profound, uh, profound space to, to put our prophet. You know, they called her Black Moses. She was our prophet, she was our leader. And um, <clears throat> I think that uh, in this country, you know, my dad's favorite movie of all time is The Matrix. He watches it. Every time mom goes out of town and I call my dad, I hear Morpheus in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that, that, that I think dreams are a big metaphor there. But anyway, I say that to say I do think that um, for those with, with faith, there is almost kind of an altered state as a re in relation to everyone else. You know, we're on, we're on a different wavelength than the rest of y'all. And you kind of need to be on a little bit of a different wavelength in order to be able to, to conceptualize something different than the status quo. Because so many of us are just kind of raised in the, in the um, you know, in kind of the routine systems and as my brother would call it, the dominant paradigms. Uh, and, uh, and you kind of are, are almost, you acquiesce to that. Um, and you know, and, yeah, and so it takes something different. So I would say, I think my grandmother, um, who when I was growing up, I thought she was a crazy woman, you know? And Baba Chuck too, he's, what are you doing with these big flamboyant African dashikis on? It's Tuesday, like, <laughs> you're embarrassing me and, you know, but, but it, was, it, was that, it was that embrace, that counter narrative that, that stood out and that, and that struck a chord uh, and, and, and kind of cut through the, the muck of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, whatever else I was into as a kid. I remembered that African dashiki. I recognized that crazy thing from my grandmother's house. And now as, you know, look at me. Uh, now I'm rocking, you know, rocking my fabrics. Uh, and so anyway, I say that to say, I don't know, that, that was kind of a, of, a, of a roundabout way to answer your question. But I do think that being kind of off kilter and different is, uh, you know, that's kind of walking in faith because not everybody is on your same page and it's risky sometimes to be different and to embrace that difference and to be able to articulate a vision that everyone else can't see but that you know is the necessary kind of path you need to be on. Um, so that's how, yeah, I think they're connected. And, and there has to be, for me, um, a belief in what is not obvious or what is not seen because the path isn't always clear uh, and if you have faith um, that there is a higher being, there's a higher order, and that, um, you know, that faith will help bring you through those times when you're confused and, and feel like you're a, at a dead end. And so uh, faith is a very important part of it for me. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much. country. 